Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and that is Courtney. Hello. So where can they find us, Court? You can find us on all forms of social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Murder Dictionary Podcast. We're on Gmail. We're everywhere. We're everywhere. Wherever you go, just search for Murder Dictionary Podcast and you'll find us. We're everywhere you want to be. Exactly. All the cool places. So one of the other things that you will find in our show notes, along with the links to all of our social media, is a link to our Patreon. So on Patreon, you will find bonus episodes, ad-free episodes, and some little perks and rewards and stuff like that. So if you want to join the club and be on the Murder Dictionary Patreon, the link is in the show notes. It's patreon.com slash murder dictionary podcast. So we have a few new people on there this week. So we've got new patrons to say thank you to. Ajawa, Brody, Gia, Paris, and longtime listener, Marsha. So thanks, you guys. Thank you, everybody. Marsha is also really active on her Facebook and stuff. So thank you to everyone that's active on there, that interacts with us and posts things. We see you with your memes and your info and your breaking news. We appreciate that. Marsha's up in there. She's part of the group. All up in it. She's in it. Also, if you haven't yet reviewed the show, we would appreciate that. It always helps us to get those five stars and positive words from you. If you aren't subscribed already, but you're a regular listener, definitely hit that subscribe button. And that's kind of pretty much it. You'll find all those links and stuff for us if you want to stay in contact in the show notes every week, along with our uh, resources for our research if you want to do any further reading. So on all of our episodes, if you want to follow up and look into the case a little bit more, we always have links in the show notes. So this week, what you will find is links to a very intense story about Aaron Campbell, our next killer kid for letter K. This one comes from Scotland. We don't get a lot of murders out of Scotland. It doesn't seem very common. Yeah, so... I was just, we got to. But I'm sure people in Scotland are sitting there screaming right now, just like, you have no idea. (laughs) No, of course they are. But that's what I mean is like on this side. That makes the national news. I don't see a lot of them. Yeah. You're right. So this one, this one made it. It's unique in that way. Yeah. Aaron Campbell was born on May 7th, 2002 in Shrewsbury, Shropshire. It's a lot. It's a lot. I think I have a little bit of a a lisp there for a second. A lot of these words are a lot for our mouths, (laughs) but we'll get there. I'm sure it seems second nature to everybody else, but... We sound so dumb, right? I feel really bad. Yeah. I know. Aaron's father, Christopher, 42-year-old Christopher, worked in the oil industry and was gone for long periods of time. Very absentee father. His mother, Jeanette, who was 54, had a drinking problem during his childhood, which, of course, made her very emotionally unavailable as a mother. Even though she was there, she wasn't really there. She was physically present. Exactly. So then you've got to think it's both parents that aren't really emotionally there for him. Yeah. And depending on what day of the week you ask her, she had no drinking problem or she did struggle. Like sometimes she admits it. Most of the time she doesn't. And I get it. I mean, there's probably some amount of processing going on of like one day she probably genuinely doesn't think it's a problem. And then there's an incident and she's like, oh, yeah, maybe it's a problem. Yeah, it's not a problem. So she definitely flip flops. Yeah, it's not a problem for her. (laughs) When Aaron was about five years old, his parents moved him and his younger sister to Rothsay on the Isle of Butte. He attended Rossay Academy, where he always got A's in math and science testing, but he would usually fail anything that was related to English. Since he did so well in math and science, his dream was to be an engineer or design video games after he went to college. It's a very different spectrum of things. Video games seems a little bit more creative, but then the engineering thing is very... Serious. The engineering is the math and science. and then Yeah, but video games, designing them involves a lot of math and science, even if it's the back end of it, you know, yeah. uh, maybe the character development and stuff like that doesn't 
Yeah. But also that speaks to kind of him being a kid. You know, if he likes video games, he wants to work in video games because kids want to like think of fun jobs because it's in an industry that he enjoys. Right. It's funny to me that it's like he's going to be an engineer. He's going to build something. He's going to be creative. Right. Or he's going to play video games. And as we know, his mother thinks that he has a problem and is addicted to violent video games. So it's it's kind of interesting. It's like so one or the other to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one reading that part of it. Yeah, but maybe just wanting to do video games speaks to the addiction, you know? Just yeah, like, of course. Well, everything in my life has to revolve around video games. Exactly. He frequently did weightlifting at the gym and did parkour. So he was really strong and physically active for his age. Since the age of 12, he also wanted to start a YouTube channel with videos of his trampoline and parkour skills. He did this. And I spent a good amount of time looking at trampoline videos. And he was good. He did tricks and stuff? Yeah, like flips. I was like, wait, why are you looking at me like I'm crazy? (laughs) No, he did flips. Like he did back flips. He would jump on the trampoline and then flip in the air and then land on his feet. I all of a sudden feel really bad because I realized I have recently <laughs> watched trampoline videos of JVN from Queer Eye doing gymnastics and stuff. And I'm like, oh, wait, I've done that because I was looking at you like that's kind of weird that you're watching kids <laughs> do trampoline stuff. But it's like they are really interesting, cool tricks. And like I just said, it really speaks to a person's athleticism when they're able to do these really cool tricks on trampolines. I just want to clarify that I was watching kids on trampolines for research Quotes for an episode. Okay. For research. Uh-huh. It sounds like, what was that? Wasn't the man show Chicks on Trampolines? That was a whole fucking part of that show. I can't believe I haven't thought of that in forever. Jesus. But yeah, this kid. For a, a, <laughs> a hot second, you low key sounded like that. I was like, what? Can you just accept that there's trampoline videos and not watch them? It's weird that you're watching a kid. But I no, get yeah. what you're saying now. Yeah, no, he was good. Yeah. I was impressed. Okay, like. He is jumping from thing to thing doing parkour, and that impressed me. Right. I don't know. But like I said, it speaks to his athleticism, and it's something that'll come up for him is he is a strong kid, and that's what people say about him, of course, that he's always at the gym. He's able to do these videos and these cool tricks. He's strong. He's athletic. You get the point. Yes. Instead of actually starting a whole channel dedicated to these trampoline skills, he began posting videos of himself watching videos of haunted houses and Slenderman online. One kid described his content saying, quote, he was obsessed with gore and violence and he was hooked on Slenderman. I think it's kind of interesting just on a side that there's a whole entire genre of videos on YouTube and stuff of like kids watching kids do stuff, filming their reaction. My nephew does this with video games. I think it is so strange, but it's kind of similar to like the 90 Day Fiance pillow talk, right? Where we watch them watch the show. I just think this is so interesting that he thought he was interesting enough. Then again, we think we're interesting enough, but right to what people want to watch is him reacting to Slenderman. Go figure. This is a thing that I find really fascinating in podcasting, in all social media at this point. I was watching a premiere of a music video last night, and the next thing below it was people reacting to this new video. Yes. And to me, I don't understand it. And you are comparing us to that. But I feel like it's a difference between presenting a story, presenting if it's not true crime, you know, some research, some history, and information to people versus you just talking about yourself, filming your reaction. I I don't understand it. I don't really personally want to watch this stuff. But I know that kids his age are really into watching each other react to current things going on. Like I've just seen my nephew just watch a kid go, oh, what? For like an hour and a half. Just, oh, huh? My niece loves toy unboxing videos. She'll watch people like review dolls and stuff. So it is something that's fairly common. And I think because it's so common, it really isn't that crazy for Aaron to believe that he could have one of these channels. If you see other kids doing it, why not think that you're interesting enough 
to just react to haunted house videos and have that be cool enough to have a whole channel, I wouldn't waste my time. But it seems very common. Yeah. So it isn't really that, although the content of it might be a little bit unnerving for someone that's 12 years old to be that obsessed with Slenderman. We know that that has been a part of a very famous murder case, the haunted houses thing. It might be scary for someone that young, but for him, that's what he wanted to do. And it speaks to his personality. I think there has to be a certain level of narcissism existing in a person to think that they're that interesting to have a whole channel dedicated to the reactions. And there has to be a little bit that's off if you're that interested in gore and violence and other kids are saying you're obsessed. Very good analysis. It speaks to your personality. Yeah. So the other things that speak to his kind of personality and some of his characteristics was that he was caught setting fires, then got sent to rehab to try and curb some of his violent behavior. Since fire starting, of course, is, we know, a red flag for serious emotional problems in children, he had to be put in a treatment center. And remember, he lives on this island of like 6,000 people. Like, that's it. That speaks volumes. And it, I think there probably was a lot of stigma, I would assume, if everybody on this small island knows that you're that kid that's obsessed with Slender Man and set fires, you know? There's something a little bit off. And I think people, all these small town people that knew him, associated him with not so great things. It's kind of sad. Yeah. He also had been in trouble for taking a knife to school, and his mom, Jeanette, had to have regularly scheduled parent-teacher conferences to get progress reports from Aaron's teachers. So they were really closely monitoring him. And even if his parents were absentee and a little bit unavailable, the teachers and the townspeople clearly seem to be invested in keeping track of what's going on with him and trying to help him get better. Yeah, I mean, there's people are noticing like, hey, this kid's probably struggling somewhere here because he's acting out. Let's pay attention to this. But all the things that have to come together just just don't. Right. It yeah. takes a lot of people to do the right thing and stay involved and stay on top of his case to make sure that he's going to be emotionally healthy. So, you know, we'll see if that happens. He also was very sexually active and reportedly he was seeing multiple girls in the small town at the same time. And none of them knew about each other. Impressive. Like, I mean, tiny town. I wouldn't def I wouldn't tiny use school that word. Well, you know? okay, sure. <laughs> you know, like it's also says a lot about this person that thinks that much about themselves again, right? It's just there's a pattern here. Right. And this kid was just allowed to do whatever he wanted because dad's out of town. Mom's physically here, not really here, right? So he's just allowed to do whatever he wants. So it doesn't seem strange to me at all that this kid is just dating laying, a bunch of girls. Laying tracks down everywhere he goes, you know? I mean, doesn't surprise me at all. No, and I think it speaks to his like need for affection and attention. I think that if you're at a really young age having multiple partners, it's not really about sex. No, it's not about at all. a lack of love at home. It's about abandonment. It's about attention. I think it's a numbers game too. Exactly. He needs the numbers high of girls to pay attention to him yeah. and like him and be able to have these conquests because he feels really sad and broken. And he you feels know? like a man when he tells everybody else about it and like, oh, this, look yeah. what I did, machismo and I'm so, uh, oh, I'm such a man, right? Like it's it goes yeah. all of it. That's the front of it. Exactly. And then what's behind it yeah. is just that sad stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So it does say a lot. It's very telling about who he is and that he can be so easily manipulative and deceptive. You know, if you're young and sexually active, but you're in a monogamous relationship with another 14 year old or whatever, well, you know, that's a different story. But if you're lying to multiple people and that's completely normal and OK with you, you know, that's it's very sad. There's something wrong there. When Aaron was 15, he started thinking and talking about, quote, doing something excessive, 
which seemed to have some sort of sexual context because many people thought that what he meant was rape or sexual assault. When I read that, that also makes me think that like he had no problem just talking about all this sexually active and everything that, you know, he had no problem telling everybody about this, which is interesting that these girls didn't know about each other, right? But but he was so vocal at the yeah. same time. Mm -hmm. He was also rumored to have sexually abused a female classmate. And then he showed pictures to his male classmates. Again, just very concerning, really, really bad behavior. And now, of course, everybody knows him for this. He's got this reputation, not only with fires and knives and all this stuff, but as a sexual predator. You know, people know him in the town for this kind of stuff. And that he obviously talks about sex and these relationships in a way that they interpret that as, oh, he's going to rape someone eventually. Right. That is a really crazy conclusion to draw from someone talking about their multiple girlfriends. But at the same time, right? it's a very logical conclusion yes. if he's filming himself with these other girls and showing it to these other boys, because that in and of itself is assaulting aggressive, you know, predator behavior. And he's still so young. He's, you know, technically when I was going through the story and stuff, he's old, quote, for a killer kid. Yeah. Because he's, you know, in his teens. But still, for this kind of behavior, I mean, it's very scary. I agree. I think, I mean, especially the where we're talking about. 6,500 people on an island? A resort town? Like, come on. Yeah, Bizarre. it's a very small community. Yeah. Everybody and you have knows no each problem. other. But we see this consistently, like what, you know, Roll Red Roll recently, yeah. Audrey and Daisy. I mean, they're not huge town. People are doing these, boys are doing this kind of stuff in small towns where word gets around and people know what's going on. And same thing. They're texting about it. They're showing pictures to their friends. There's conversations online about it. People know that this young kid is a sexual predator and it just persists. All the kids know it and nothing happens until something drastic happens. At age 16, he exchanged Facebook messages with a female friend talking about a crime documentary he'd seen and saying, quote, might kill one day for the lifetime experience. Again, just very creepy, concerning behavior. You know, as people that are involved in true crime, there's these different sides of it, right? Sometimes you see these people posting memes or saying certain things like, oh, I, I think about killing people every day. And they think that that's funny, that it's like, well, I haven't had my coffee, might kill someone. To me, that's not funny. And especially as someone that's a kid that's 16, it's really, really fucked up. I just know that I've seen every crime thing there is, and I've never come away from it going, hey, Brianna, I think one day I might kill for the lifetime experience. Exactly. Which tells me that it's like, it's still okay. I can still watch these movies. It's fine. We're still okay here, right? right. The moment that I call you and say that, you're like, maybe it's time... We look at it from a different angle. Maybe we need to talk to somebody about this. Yeah, right? that's the day I'm like, court, you're fired. <laughs> it's finally hit. Yeah, you're fired. It's time to take a rest, right? Yeah. Because, yeah, nobody, I just don't think it's normal to have that kind of conclusion, to consume true crime content and have the reaction that it's okay to do those behaviors and very casually talk about doing those behaviors or joke about doing those things. It's just not okay. It really says something about you. You it's know? not an idea. It's not a meme. It's an option. Right. Yeah. For him, it's clearly an option. <laughs> Scary. That's just terrifying. Several neighborhood kids and adults say that Aaron had been torturing and skinning cats as well. Again, all the, the fire, the cats, the sexual behavior, you can see from a mile away what's coming for this kid. Bedwetting is the only one that right. was never outright said. There were also people that reported he had been doing, quote, voodoo rituals where he would sacrifice animals and bury them in his backyard. That's where the cats came in. But my thing is, was this a little bit of um, 
Was it exaggeration? Were they sensationalizing it? I believe that the animal cruelty happened, but the voodoo rituals makes me think, are they maybe making some stuff up? I believe the voodoo ritual aspect of it, and that's why I worded it the way I did. Sensationalism. He yes. was definitely killing animals. Right. And, you know, this was found reported, rumored to have a lot of these things were later on articles that had come out maybe six months after that I would find, you know, it's a little like the sun, right? The mirror, a little bit more sensational, but multiple find out about animals, killing animals. The voodoo ritual thing comes up again and again because one person said it in the very beginning. They're like, oh, he would do voodoo rituals. And then it became this rumor thing. But the fact that this rumor had legs is a little like, oh, okay, maybe. And you know what? He's kind of a shock value guy. I could see him maybe one time, right? Yeah, saying oh, something that exactly. he knew could be Ruhedia, sensationalized. Right? Something. Yeah. But I think that although we know from multiple people that it's confirmed that there was animal cruelty and killing of animals, we definitely can't take that leap to confirm that there were voodoo rituals. And if anything, he may have just said something casually just to get a reaction. That Probably. seems like more likely. Sounds like Aaron. But the room, <laughs> of course, when that happens in a small town, one person hears it, one person says it, that rumor grows legs. So it probably was a reputation he may have had, you know? There were also murmurings and rumors about Aaron, one of which was that he had held a seven-year-old girl underwater at a swimming pool. But it's unclear, again, if this was just local gossip because there was never any charges, because, you know, it wasn't confirmed. I just don't want to say that he did it for sure without knowing. It was basically confirmed. It was just that they couldn't, sit, like, the nefarious manner of it. Did he hold her down on purpose or was it, oh, he was just playing with her in the pool? Either way, this little girl was held underwater for a long period of time. Like, mm. it happened. But again, this is like a rumor of his uh, motivation. And after the fact, yeah, of course, everything's evil and sadistic, right? Yeah, looking but, back on hindsight is 2020 yeah. or whatnot. And there's a lot of, lot of anecdotes with this kid where one at a time, it's like, oh, I don't know if that really happened. But then you just look at like the big picture of the things that even before the murder that they would talk about, it, you know. Yeah, it seems to troublemaker. be a pattern. You know, yeah. And beyond even troublemaking or mischief or rebellion, yeah. he's actually doing things that consistently harm other living things. They're concerning. Right. Whether yeah. it's the sexual stuff, the pool issue, and, you know, the setting fires and knives. I mean, these are all things designed to be victimizing other people. So, yeah, you're right. That is, we even if we don't have a confirmed, yes, he wasn't playing and he intended to harm or kill this girl, we still know that this behavior is concerning and part of the pattern that has arose for him, that he's just kind of a violent kid. This is like Mindhunter 101. Right. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. It is, huh? As Aaron became a teen, he became a known partier and people would regularly see him drinking alcohol with other kids around town. The crowd he hung with were all partying and strangely quite aware of what businesses had surveillance cameras and which ones didn't. Aaron's mom said, quote, if I went to the police, my son would be in trouble. I just hoped he'd grow out of it. Anyway, it wasn't every weekend. It was only occasionally. I'm just a cool mom. Right. Exactly. I'm a cool mom. You can drink here. Don't worry. As long as you're not out. You know, I'm a cool mom. It's like, stop it. Stop right now. It's just, you know, there's points where it's like, wait, what are you doing? Stop. Turn around. Go the other direction with him. You know? Yeah. This is never going to be good for your kid to just allow this behavior to happen. He's going to persist and keep getting worse. It's not going to get better. I had... um a family that I house sat for sometimes. I did a lot of babysitting and house sitting when I was younger. And there was this one family one time that had a ton of animals, just like 
horse, guinea pigs, chickens that they needed taken care of while they're away, right? And I loved them. They were great, total hippies. So I was like, yeah, let me do this. Turns out their daughter, who was I think like 16 at the time, 15, 16, was going to be at the house. But she's like, you don't need to take care of the daughter. Everything's going to be fine. But they are going to be partying. Just take care of the animals. She's like, I know they're going to be doing mushrooms. They've got like she gave me basically a list of the drugs that they had that they were going to do. And she's like, yeah, they're going to be doing them while you're here. So I was just staying at this house in the other room the whole time, knowing that all these kids were partying. But I'm not the parent. There's nothing I can do about it. So she gave me money for these kids. And she's like, you know, whatever they need, if they need some beers, if they need some zigzags, if they need whatever, go buy it for them. It was one of the most uncomfortable situations I've ever been in because I'm like, kids are going to be kids. It's a completely other thing when the adults are co-signing it and encouraging that behavior. This was the early 2000s? Mm, Late 2000s, yeah. Oh, okay. Or actually, yeah, early 2000s, mid 2000s. It was a little bit crazy. But I kept thinking of stuff like this, where it's like, if you're encouraging this behavior, and especially the person that I'm you know, referring to didn't necessarily have a history of violence or any bad behavior or anything, but had already been to rehab, just like Aaron had already been to, you know, mental health, like a rehab facility. What are you telling your child about this behavior if you are allowing them to continue to drink alcohol and party around town? It's the easy way out. Like, how do you expect them to be fully functioning adults and be emotionally healthy If you're co-signing that behavior. Yeah, you're not parenting. But again, like we said at the beginning, mom had an alcohol problem. You can't necessarily call out your kid when you're not willing to stay sober. Jeanette, again and again and again, just it she doesn't want to cause trouble. Yeah. Make waves, doesn't want to upset anyone. So she just, you know, has her own shit going on and just is cool to let Aaron kind of live his life as long as he gets good grades. Is is what it, you know. The big picture is here. I guess, yeah. If he's got the math and science grades to back it up, yeah, then he can do whatever he wants is apparently the attitude. But we all know that's just really unhealthy to let your kid do that. But it really didn't seem out of the ordinary, especially because there were so many kids on the Isle of Butte who partied hard and often. It was just somewhat of an open secret. There were quite a few middle school age kids that were already alcoholics in Butte. Kids could often be found doing drugs in the back gardens of homes. This is where the surveillance camera thing comes in too. Right. Like I said earlier, they knew exactly how not to get caught. They were aware of where the cameras were. Yeah. When asked about the drug use, one of the Butte residents said, quote, at least they're not drinking themselves stupid like their parents. Which is just, you know, they're all cool moms. Everyone on the Isle of Butte is a cool mom. (laughs) It's an island full of cool moms. That's it. Yeah. And I definitely, I don't want to demonize the entire island of, No, it's just, you know, this is But it seemed to be an open secret. And whenever you read about this story, it always comes up, the alcoholism. So we're not really pulling it out of thin air or blaming the parents. It just seems like it's a really important factor to know that these kids were out here partying and no one, nobody was really holding them accountable or telling them not to do it. Although, of course, not everyone on the Isle of Butte were alcoholics or addicts, at the time, it seemed to be a higher than average percentage, especially from what you hear in the news about this story. Finding the right pros for home projects can be tough and spark a lot of questions like, how do I find a pro who can help? Will they do a good job? Will I get a fair price? That's where HomeAdvisor can help. From leaky faucets to major remodels, HomeAdvisor connects you to the right pro for the job in seconds and even helps you get a fair price. Read reviews, check project cost guides, and book appointments. Go to HomeAdvisor.com or download the free HomeAdvisor app to start your next project. Introducing the Capital One Walmart Rewards Card. Earn unlimited 5% back on everything you buy at Walmart online. It's the perfect card for all your family's hints this holiday season. Like 5% back on the air fryer Grandpa told you about when he fell asleep in his chair. Mm, He didn't fry anything. 
Or 5% back on the laptop your sister had carolers sing to you. Two turtle doves and a laptop for Carrie. The Capital One Walmart Rewards Card. Earn unlimited rewards, including 5% back at Walmart Online. What's in your wallet? Terms and exclusions apply. Capital One Gen A. Like Aaron's mom, many parents on the Isle of Butte just accepted that their kids would party and they hoped they'd just grow out of it, even if evidence suggested that they were already alcoholics. I think a lot of kids, you know, go through this and they do just kind of grow out of it. Right. It's a or rebellious they, phase. And yeah, that's they, it. they like somehow end up responsible drinkers like it you know they drink so much when they're were teens and they'll tell you like oh my parents let me, I don't really drink a lot you know now and it's like okay so I think they were just like hoping and they were probably raised that way because exactly. it's this entire island it's just kind of the environment and I mean not like hating just stating right from Everything. what we could find the mm -hmm. information suggests that it was generation after generation and like i said about Jeanette, it's difficult for parents that are constantly drinking to tell their kids not to drink especially if they're exhibiting these signs of alcoholism themselves but Jeanette had no hesitation telling aaron that he couldn't smoke weed and trying to do everything in her power to get him to stop reefer madness so right? that's where she draws the line, yeah, apparently. That's it. Aaron was often getting his weed from 26-year-old Robert McPhail and his 17-year-old girlfriend, Tony McLaughlin. You read it right. And it's important to point out, again, that he's 26, she is 17. Tony is 17 years old. Yeah. And it, Robert is the neighbor. They live very close to each other. So it's the easiest place for him to get weed. Just yeah. run a couple houses down and that's it. And they're these big estate properties, like Kennedy Compound kind of properties. So to say it's a neighbor, it's still, you know, they got some distance. Yeah, a little bit. But, you know, they're but right it's next close to each other. enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At one point, he had an issue with the quality of weed that Robert gave him. And they had a falling out where he still owed 10 pounds, which is less than $13 important to point out. What a drug debt. Right? <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. <laughs> when Aaron's mom found out where Aaron was getting his weed, she confronted the couple and effectively ended their connect in early 2018. So Aaron had very little contact with Robert after this. I assume they saw each other around because they're next door, but that's pretty much it. They wave at each other when they pull into the driveway. Right. Where's Typical my 13 neighbor. bucks? Typical neighbor. <laughs> On June 30th, 2018, 28-year-old Robert's six-year-old daughter, Alicia, came to his parents' picturesque waterfront home on the coastline along the Isle of Butte just to spend three weeks there on summer holiday. Alicia was happy to spend some time with her father because her parents had broken up when she was only three months old, and since then, she had been living with her mom. Alicia was born in Glasgow on October 22nd, 2011. Her mom, Georgina Loughran, was only 16 when she had Alicia, and Robert was actually only 19. So their baby made their just very new teenage relationship extremely difficult. I mean, yeah, especially Alicia's three months old and they break up, like for good, they're done. She's 16 years old. With a three-month-old, he's 19, they're kids, you know. It's really hard to have a relationship survive that. A teenage relationship is just, they don't often last long anyway. When you add a kid into the picture, it's just a really, really difficult to stay together. There's an entire industry behind 16 and pregnant and teen mom right. that backs this up. Absolutely. Being a teen mom is not ideal. Alicia loved school, writing, gymnastics, and baking. Alicia was very familiar with the Isle of Butte since she spent every other weekend there with her father at her grandparents' house. So Butte is 47 square miles with a small population of 6,500, where, like we said, everyone knows each other and because of this, they often leave their doors unlocked. It's considered really safe, so why not? 
At one point, it was a popular tourist destination with a lot of beachfront hotels that were perfect for escaping the big city for a weekend. Alicia's mom, Georgina, was always comfortable with her daughter spending time in Butte because it was considered such a safe place and perfect for children. I mean, they're just leaving doors unlocked and open. So, yeah, you must, right? It's like, oh, yeah, sure, take her for the weekend. No problem. Right. If you live in a city, I mean, it's safer than where you're living. All the doors are unlocked. There's other kids to play with. You know, of course she's going to trust that Alicia's going to be okay on Butte. There was so little crime there that one time the courthouse was closed simply for lack of use. You just don't hear that a lot in true crime. Right? There was just not enough cases to keep it open. That is insane. I mean, that's where you want to live. That's utopia. It's perfect. It's where you want to be. Right. That's where you want to send your kid. Yep. That's where you want to send Alicia to hang out and have a holiday. See your grandparents. Exactly. Alicia attended a Highland dance class on the aisle, and teachers said she showed real potential in the class. I mean, she was there enough that she's enrolled in a dance class. Yeah. She has, like, relationships on the island. People know her. She's a little tiny. She's so cute, a little six-year-old girl. Yeah. She has friends and, like, people that notice and care. But again, it's a small community. So yeah. even visitors, you know them. So cute. On the same night Alicia arrived in town, Aaron was camping with friends to celebrate the summer break from school. In the early morning hours of July 1st, he sent a Snapchat video from the campsite to about 15 people. In the snap, he invited them over to his parents' house to party the following night. His parents had a huge seven-bedroom home with a view of the Firth of Clyde, so his friends liked hanging out there, of course. They all had pretty cool properties, but his is pretty awesome. Right. I mean, it's a beachy island. I mean, it's all going to be nice houses, but there's some that are going to be a little bit nicer than others. Yeah, it's right on the water. At the party that night, people noticed that he drank a bottle of Mad Dog and got extremely drunk. On July 1st, 2018, the same night as Aaron's party, Alicia was put to bed in her room at her grandparents' house with a Peppa Pig DVD playing. Around 11 p.m., Robert's 17-year-old girlfriend, Tony, checked and saw that Alicia was asleep in her bedroom. Alicia slept in the bedroom that's closest to the front door. Of course, since Butte was considered such a safe place. And they left the key in the lock of the front door. Again, this was very normal for the community because of how safe people thought it was. The thing I don't understand is it's one thing to keep it unlocked. It's another thing to put the key in the lock because I feel like it's just advertising that it's open. If it's unlocked and people don't know because you can't visibly tell, that's one thing. But it's very strange to me that you would just put a a key in the lock, you know? I could see... Like, I know people who leave keys in the door on the inside. Right. Right, for, like, the bolt. But what are, I mean, on the outside where you can see it walking down the street. But they just think that nobody scary is going to walk down the street and see it. Yeah, We know everybody. But I don't know. It's just, it's one thing to know everybody and trust that it's going to be okay and not put a key in there. Like, visibly you can't see. But there's something extra about putting the key in there that just stands out to me. It's very strange. I know everybody and I don't trust anyone. So what are you going to (laughs) do? Right? Like, nope. (laughs) At the same time that Tony was checking on Alicia, Aaron was at his house party being a bit of a downer, obsessing about an argument that he'd gotten into with his mom earlier in the evening. By about 12.30 a.m. on July 2nd, he was extremely emotional, and one of his friends found him in bed seeming to be a bit suicidal. Those are the words the friend used. Suicidal. He found him so drunk upset. Like, I don't know. Tequila. If I drink tequila, I just start crying. 
Like everything becomes so emotional, so over the top, right? And I just imagine like he drank this bottle of Mad Dog, right? And was just drunk out of his mind, upset, and just wailing away about, you know, his horrible situation with his mom. Yeah, I think that, you know, we've all, if you're an adult, you've seen this. You've seen a distraught yes. drunk. There's yes. different types and categories of drunk people. You see happy ones. You see ones that want to fight. But you do see often these people that really just let all their emotions out as yeah. soon as the alcohol is in their system. And that's where he was at that night. He just drank a lot and was completely unloading all his feelings to the point where it seemed like he was a danger to himself. Like he just didn't want to go on, you know, and people could see that. People knew that that's where he was at emotionally. So the friend knew since he was in such a dark place that he might need some help. And he asked if he wanted him to stay for moral support. And Aaron said, it's okay. I'll be fine. You can go. Aaron informed his friend that he planned to just go buy some weed from Robert so he could just chill out a bit and then he'd be okay. He'd just go to sleep. He just needed more, a different drug, right? right. And he'd be fine. It'll be cool. He's 16. And he's trying to just manage all of his levels with various substances. So if he was an adult, right, with access to prescriptions, it would probably be like, oh, I'll just take a Xanax and go to sleep. Yeah. Right? Like, but he can't get, so... I'm just going to smoke some weed. And it's funny, again, that his mom is against him smoking weed, right? And they got into the fight earlier. He's wasted drunk. Oh, I'm just going to go smoke some weed and I'll be fine. I see a lot on this one. I was an angsty teen kid who did a lot of drinking, drugs, all this shit, right? I kind of like, he's a, the devil. He's an evil person, right? But like, you can just see where he was dropping off. Things went wrong. For Things him. were going wrong. Yeah. yeah. Hindsight. In every episode, I'm looking at people's backgrounds, their family, their mental health, and the ways that people around them have failed them, you know, because he is, like you said, he's just a person that kind of slipped through the cracks in the sense that people saw all of these things happening. They saw this violent, dangerous behavior and didn't intervene enough and stay persistent enough on his treatment. He needed to really have people jump in and say, hey, you need to stay in this facility. We sent you to rehab for the fire. You need to stay there a little bit longer or you need to go back or let's get you a regular therapist. It didn't seem like any of that was happening. So he was just left to deal with his emotions by drinking and smoking weed. So it, it's really sad. At about 1.45 a.m., Aaron messaged Robert on Facebook and then remembered that he still owed him 10 pounds, so he messaged Tony instead. But neither of them responded. He messaged a few other kids in the area, but none of them responded either. So at this point, Aaron started to get a bit desperate. And since, of course, he felt entitled to just take whatever he wanted, he decided to go over to Robert's house and steal their weed. This sounds like a crazy conclusion, but he's drunk too. Right. I kept forgetting that. I was like, what is wrong with this kid? A little prick thinks he's just going to break into somebody's house and steal their weed. Like, what the fuck, right? And then I'm like, oh, wait, he's wasted. Yeah. I mean, it still doesn't make any sense, but he's drunk as shit. Yeah, he's, uh, like we said before, very narcissistic, a little bit self-involved. He's drunk. I mean... There's a lot going on here when he makes this decision to just go steal. And this is where it's like it changes. Before leaving his house, he decided to take a kitchen knife with him. But once he saw that the door had a key already inside the lock, he tossed the knife onto the shore and just walked in through the front door. So again, like I said, the key is that sign that it's safe to just go inside. We're not armed. We're not going to stop you. It's not locked. It's just, it's so sad that that key was there because that was a sign to him that it was a green light. And also it's like he takes this kitchen knife with him over there expecting really to have problems getting in there or to have to be like, hey, I'll stab you in the face if you don't give me your weed, something, right? But when he sees that key, it's like, oh, I don't even need this knife. I can just strong arm this shit out of those people, right? Like, I don't even need my knife. I'm not even a threat. Yeah. Like that to me is like he takes the knife, game changer. 
because it's not just, you know, oh, they're going to, I'll just go get some weed from them. I'm going to take it from them now. Exactly. Like, it's a yeah. clear sign that he wasn't going over to buy weed. He no. was going over to rob someone. Yes. Once Aaron was inside the house, he found six-year-old Alicia asleep in her bed in the room, again, closest to the front door. He says that once he saw her, quote, all I thought about was killing her. He carefully picked Alicia up so that she would stay asleep, and then he carried her right out the front door, walking with her in his arms along the shore. Which, it, I mean, he just walked in, poked his head in that room, and he just forgot all about why he was there. Yeah, no more weed, no nothing. nothing. It's about just doing something violent now. She woke up in his arms and looked up and just asked who he was. So he figured he had to calm her down and reassure her. He replied that he was a friend of her father and was taking her home, most likely just to keep her quiet so that he could get her somewhere more remote, I'm assuming. And of course she's going to believe it. You know, you're a friend of my dad. I'm just taking you home. You're from a place that's always safe. Everybody trusts each other on the island. So as a kid, you're going to believe what this adult is telling you. That conversation between him and her is like the most diabolical thing to me. Yes. This whole interaction. He knows what's going to happen. And he's, again, he's comfortable just deceiving people so he can get what he wants, which is awful, violent things. To a baby. So sad. Yeah. Alicia said that she was cold, so he gave her his shirt to keep her warm. Aaron took her to a secluded spot on the beach near this old abandoned hotel where he raped Alicia multiple times. Afterwards, he decided to kill her like he had originally wanted to do when he found her that night. So he put his hands over her nose and mouth to keep her from breathing. And then he applied pressure until she was smothered to death. Then Aaron threw his clothes into the ocean, left Alicia on the beach, and returned to his house to shower. These are all things also that shows even though he's so young, he's already concerned about cleaning up a crime scene, not leaving any evidence. These are things he's aware of because, again, he's thought about doing this. Well, also think about this, too. He's got a video of, or he's got a, this want to have a channel about Slender Man and about haunted houses and stuff. He talked about seeing a true crime documentary with the friend earlier. So he does seem to have, like, a criminal knowledge of, of um, you know, I'm the perpetrator and how to clean up, you know, your crime scene, if you will. And yeah, there's a lot of it where, you know, he changes clothes, throws the bag of clothes out, and like does all these things to to cover his tracks. And I mean... Yeah, I think it's clear that true crime isn't something that you just digest one way. You know what I mean? Like, if you or I are watching true crime, we're thinking about personal safety, we're thinking about mental health. He's coming at it from a... This is a rule book. This is a learning experience. This is how I teach myself to get away with things, which is, I mean, there's a clear difference. And he's still, again, a 16-year-old, and he's already thinking like this. Yeah. For me, like, I watch this. It's a cautionary tale. Exactly. Right? This is an option for this kid. Like, again, you know, these are all options that he, you know, oh, I'll make sure to, when I do it, I'll do it like that put that in the drawer of things to remember when I'm cleaning up a crime scene because I saw it on this, you know. He's 16 years old, too. Yeah, he's consuming His exposure paranormal, is television. true crime, the internet. a bunch of violent and gore things, but he's interpreting it as how can I get away with this? What can I do to inflict pain on other people? Which is different than, a, you know, most other people are viewing true crime. It's very, very scary and sad. So suddenly he realized once he was home that he didn't have his phone with him. So Aaron quickly got dressed, grabbed a flashlight, and ran back to where he had murdered Alicia. He searched frantically until he found his phone. Then again, he left her body there on the sand. 
Now, I can only speculate on this because I am not a killer, but I know what it's like to put your hand on your pocket and you don't have your phone, right? So I can only imagine, like, you've just murdered this little girl. You, you've covered your tracks. You've done all these things. And then, oh, my God, you don't have your phone. And you're only 16. It's like you, you don't have your front temporal lobe is not fully formed. Like, these plans are not cohesive, right? And now you're, oh, my God, I can't find my phone. Panicking. Panic. You've got to go back to the scene where you know you already have that mind to think, how can I cover this up and not leave forensics? But now you have to go back to the scene. He's freaking yeah. out. I can only imagine. At 6 a.m., Alicia's grandfather woke up for work and he found that Alicia was not in her bed. That's the moment you just go cold, right? Like she's six years old. It just gives me chills. I, it's heartbreak. I can't even imagine that feeling. So he's frantically searching the house for her, going into every room looking for traces, but he saw no sign of her being in the house. They immediately knew that she had not run away. Her bike was still there, and she definitely just wasn't the kind of kid to take off on her own. Because, of course, that's the first thing you want to think is maybe she went to a friend's house. Maybe, you know, she got up early and went to play. Who knows? She's six. This is a Scottish Isle. Maybe she looked outside and saw a bunny on the grass. Right. And was like, oh, a rabbit, Peppa Pig. She saw something. She ran outside, and she's on the other side of the house, outside, and you can't see her. That's what you hope, yeah. you know? But they knew that no matter what happened, it wasn't an option for her to just run away and take off. By 6.23 a.m., Alicia's grandmother notified the police, who quickly initiated a full search with as many members of law enforcement as possible. Right away, a helicopter was dispatched for air support, and the Coast Guard began searching the shorelines by 6.55 a.m. It was a really, really quick response. Yeah, within 20 minutes, they, I mean, the cops were headed over there. A helicopter's less than an hour. As the police were searching, Alicia's grandmother was attempting to get the word out to the community that Alicia was missing. And she did this by posting it on Facebook. Sadly, this is how Alicia's mother, Georgina, found out that her daughter had gone missing. It's terrible. I can't even imagine. At 7 a.m., a Coast Guard volunteer found a kitchen knife in the sand near the McPhail home. Search party members who had heard about the disappearance from Facebook were about a 15-minute walk away from the house looking around the abandoned hotel. At 8.54 a.m., a man from the Facebook search party named George Williams found Alicia's naked body on the grounds of the abandoned hotel. At 9 a.m., Robert saw the Facebook messages that Aaron sent when he was looking for weed the night before. So Robert messaged him back, asking what Aaron wanted. Aaron replied, quote, Sorry, doesn't matter now, and then put laughing emojis on his message. It's just such like teenage shit to me. Like, sorry, it doesn't matter now. Like, I just hear this like asshole just because I don't like him. But I would think that <laughs> if it was just a, a normal interaction, but knowing that he had killed Robert's daughter. Well, yeah. It's just chilling that he would have that sort of response. Terrible. It's disgusting. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And it just like, oh, I can just hear this smarmy asshole. Saying, especially after watching all these trampoline videos, right? Like, I, that motherfucker, ooh, I hate him. Yeah. When Tony messaged Aaron back and asked him to keep an eye out for Alicia, he replied, quote, Oh, damn, I'm sure she's not went too far. After Alicia's body was found, a rush autopsy was conducted on the same day. Again, the response is so quick for this law enforcement. It's really incredible, the work that they did so quickly. 
They really just jumped on it. They knew that this was a this was gravity, big and time. And if it had been a situation where she was still alive, or you know whatever the case, like if she was still alive in the situation, this is what saves a kid. This is what keeps them from being killed by a predator is quick response. And it's amazing that they were so quick and so tragic that this was one of those situations where she was already gone. You also, you cannot let this person get off the island. Right, exactly. It was determined that she had 117 injuries, most of which were inflicted while she was still alive. Her face and neck injuries confirmed that she had been held with a tight grip. Injuries to her nose and mouth indicated that she had died by being smothered as a result of forceful pressure to her neck and face. The injuries to her genitalia were reportedly described as, quote, catastrophic. The pathologist also noted that her feet were clean and uninjured, suggesting that she had been carried on the beach. That changes everything, too. Right. Because that's somebody taking care, you know, putting enough effort in. All This just changes it from some, like, random vagrant that stole her and just dragged her on the sand, you know? Yeah, this is definitely someone that took care of her beforehand. Yeah. Maybe someone that knew her. Like, mm-hmm. it really is an important piece of evidence because it speaks to someone really taking that extra step to be providing some sort of safety for her on the way yeah. to doing such a violent, horrific thing. The Butte community took the news really hard and felt like it could have been any one of their children. The police responded to these heightened emotions by ensuring that every resource possible would be available to their detectives, and they closed down sections of the town during the investigations. The McPhail's home and its surrounding areas were searched repeatedly. Detectives began theorizing early on that the killer was still on Butte, but They kept their suspicions very quiet, leaving everyone to speculate on the identity of the killer. I imagine everyone's looking at each other just like, is it you? Yeah, I know it's one of you. Is it you? Yeah. And it does create this really, really heightened tension within the community because everyone's speculating. And oftentimes, you know, us as people that are into true crime, we know that the percentage of probability that it's someone close is very high. So I'm wondering how many people were speculating that it was someone inside the house, that it was someone that was maybe a teacher or someone that was at their church. They were probably looking to the people closest to Alicia and pointing the finger at them. So it's a very, very high tension sort of And if there's any weird guy in the town, right, that he's just always off, That's the other thing. It's either the family or, you know, it's someone that you are going to pinpoint as the problem in the community. You're going to start profiling people. And a lot of times it's vulnerable populations of people that you're going to point the finger at. Yeah. We see this time and time again. Like you said, just pointing the finger at the vagrant or the person that's known to have mental health issues. You're going to demonize them. There's no in between. It's just it's really sad. Finding the right pros for home projects can be tough and spark a lot of questions like, how do I find a pro who can help? Will they do a good job? Will I get a fair price? That's where HomeAdvisor can help. From leaky faucets to major remodels, HomeAdvisor connects you to the right pro for the job in seconds and even helps you get a fair price. Read reviews, check project cost guides, and book appointments. Go to HomeAdvisor.com or download the free HomeAdvisor app to start your next project. Early on in the investigation, an irresponsible TV journalist named Katie Hopkins started retweeting and giving life to a right-wing conspiracy theory that claimed a Syrian refugee had committed the murder. Again, you're going to point the finger at someone that's a vulnerable, like, easy target. It's disgusting. This angered many people who believed that she was, quote, 
using the death to further the cause for the far right. Now, Katie Hopkins is very problematic in general. She's the one that when Peaches Geldof went on her show talking about attachment parenting, she just tried to destroy her. And it was so mean spirited. At least mm -hmm. I thought it was just like not necessary. She also has epilepsy and had surgery and now doesn't really have seizures after that. Side note. Hmm. fellow epilepsy sufferer. Has it made her any nicer? No, she's still crazy. Like, she's she's not a pleasant... You mean she's still mean? <laughs> that's what I mean. She's still mean. She's not pleasant. And it's just, it doesn't surprise me that she's trying to be inflammatory, you know, with this. And this is bullshit to try to put this out there when they have priorities. We have, need to find someone, not put out a conspiracy theory. Right. The reality is we need to stay focused on what happened to this little girl finding the person and keeping all the other children on the Isle of Butte safe. Because the more you focus on pointing fingers at someone that's part of the right wing agenda, the less you're focusing on keeping other kids safe. It is very irresponsible. Detectives were canvassing the area and asking neighbors if they'd had any information. And Aaron's mom, Jeanette, said that she had not seen anything. But she did explain to detectives that their home had a CCTV surveillance system. So she offered to check the footage and see if the cameras caught anything unusual the night of her disappearance. When Jeanette viewed the footage from that night, she saw Aaron leave the house at 1.54 a.m. and return at 3.35 a.m. She then saw that he left a second time in a hurry carrying a flashlight and arrived back home at 4.07 a.m. Since she knew that this was within the time that the police believed Alicia was abducted and murdered, Jeanette asked Aaron why he would left the house alone twice in the middle of the night. And how come the second time when he comes back, he straight vaults over a wall? He's in such a hurry. Mm. Like, these videos, he's parkouring it. Yeah, he seems frantic. Oh, he's been training for this. Like, he vaults that wall. It's, I mean, the first time he, like, kind of climbs over, it's like, he is hauling ass. He has got, what is it called? Spring in a step. <laughs> he's going. He made excuses, but Jeanette was concerned that it would be a problem if people found out later that Aaron was out of the house that night. So she went to the police and gave them the footage, thinking that this would help exonerate her son. You know, if you think that he's innocent, of course you think that this is positive evidence, right? Yeah, and they're going to judge him more harshly if he comes later and it's like, why didn't you tell this to us in the beginning, you know? But when you watch that footage, something's not right. Yeah, if you're concealing it, then that is definitely a problem. It yeah. comes out later, then it's like, well, you have something to hide. But she's hoping for the best. Yeah. You know, she's just praying to God that he has a story for this and maybe he'll tell the cops the truth. Or right? that they'll just find the other person in the meantime. Or she know? just knows that it's obvious, like, this is what happened. They're next door. This is what's going on. I need to just give this to them. Like, I'm going to say this, but I know deep down what's going on. I have to believe that Jeanette knew. I think she had to have some sort of suspicion. As much that as he you was involved don't want to believe it, mm -hmm. you still think, oh, man, this has to mean that he was there. Or it, maybe he just covered it up. Maybe he just carried the body. Something. Like best case scenario, maybe one of his friends yes. did it. And she, you know, thinks that he got a call in the middle of the night and he went out to help a friend. Right. I think that that's in her mind, like, okay, yeah, maybe that's what happened. Because she can't accept that her son is a killer. No. If she can't accept that he has an alcohol and drug problem, she's definitely not going to accept that he did something this extreme. Aaron told a friend that he was anxious that he'd be blamed because his house was so close to the McPhail house. On July 3rd, Aaron used his iPhone to Google, quote, how do police find DNA? I thought he watched true crime shows. You should know better. 
You he's know? 16. This is another example of a 16-year-old front temporal lobe. He seems to think that he's an expert, but clearly... Just ask him. He'll tell you. Right. He's an expert. Aaron also sent a Snapchat video to 25 people where he showed his reflection in a mirror and he wrote the text, quote, found the guy who had done it on the posted snap. Again, with this verb business. Basically just an announcement yeah. of just, hey, here's the killer and then a picture of himself. Yeah, it's in a mirror. It's his face in a mirror. And it's just like smarmy as fuck. Aaron was interviewed by detectives as a possible witness, and he remained calm while he cooperated fully with their questioning. He openly admitted that he was just trying to buy weed from Robert and get high because he was upset with his mom that night. Kind of, I mean, I think that's smart. Yeah, like, yeah, I was there, but here's my alibi. Is like, I was there, but for another reason. So I went over to the house trying to get weed, I was mad at my mom. Yeah. There's a story. It works. Yeah. It's relatable. And in know. his brain, this is going to work. Yeah. Otherwise, he wouldn't have talked. And on some level, you have to think it is true, right? It's different than what actually happened. Yeah. But his intention was to get weed. He doesn't have to mention he can omit the details about how he planned to use violence, about how he brought a knife. But he was trying to find weed that night. So it's probably the easiest lie to tell because there is a foundation of truth in it. The footage of him leaving was just too damaging to ignore. And on July 4th, 2018, he was brought in again on suspicion of being involved with Alicia's murder. Once he was taken to the police station, Aaron stopped talking and answered no comment to every question, which, of course, just immediately looks bad. Yeah, right? I thought you were just looking for weed. Yeah. Once that happens, then the detective know he has something to hide. On July 5th, 2018, he was charged with the rape and murder of Alicia McPhail. Alicia's funeral was held on July 21st and was attended by hundreds of mourners. Again, I can't imagine because the whole community thought, this could have been my kid. We all have our doors unlocked. This could have been any one of us. They really seem to have taken it very personally. Yeah. It, and they, again, all knew each other. So it was someone so close. It's not like... In L.A. where I don't even know my neighbors, you know? Absolutely <laughs> not like L.A. <laughs> right. I mean, this is a town where everybody knows each other. Everybody is part of a community. There's this, you know, of course, the saying of it takes a village to raise a child. Well, the Isle of Butte is the situation they're talking about. Yeah. The whole village was raising this child. They've got the dance teacher that know them. They've got probably people at church. The neighbors know each other. It's a very close, tight-knit community. So this could have been any one of their children, and it was someone they knew, instead of other big towns where people don't know each other. It's very sad. Aaron's trial began on February 1st, 2019, in Glasgow, with Judge Lord Matthews presiding. Aaron pled not guilty to abducting, raping, and murdering Alicia. During testimony, jurors heard that Aaron had a history of anxiety, self-harm, depression, and had exhibited behavior that warranted testing for ADHD. But with that, he was never diagnosed. Throughout the trial, Aaron's girlfriend stood by him, saying that she was devastated, but she would stand by her man. This is not a Tammy Wynette song. You don't have to do this. Right. You don't. And you're young as fuck. You're only like 16, girl. Come on. Because you know it's one of these girls he's juggling. That's the thing is how does he have a girlfriend when he's known to just be sleeping with a bunch of different girls? Not only does he have a girlfriend, but there is an article that specifically points out how beautiful and just devastatingly gorgeous and dark hair this girlfriend, the prettiest of all of them, mm. which was just very like, why are we 
it was really like a weirdly. Why are we pointing this out? Why are we pointing? Yeah. 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 Just sexualizing her. I think also what it was, was how could this beautiful girl, so beautiful, has the world, right? Stay with this person knowing what he had done. And it was just like, this is very weirdly put. Yeah. They're probably kind of. uh, It was very dramatized and made into like, you know, how the sun, the mirror, these tabloids. Our right. inquirer. It was taking this and making it tabloid fodder, but it was just really grossly done, which usually it is. Yes. We and they're world, trying you know, to make it this. seem like, oh, well, she could have whatever, but she's choosing to stand by this murderer that tragic. we Tragic. Yes. Right. All of she's this. She's a tragic figure in this. Yes. But again, I mean, it's just, how does he even have a girlfriend? I mean, there's so many girls that could come forward and say, I was sleeping with him too. So I, I just... It's the trampoline videos. (laughs) Jurors were shown the CCTV footage from Jeanette Campbell's home, showing that Aaron had left the house twice between the times of 1.54 a.m. and 4.07 a.m. The jurors also saw footage from another camera that Jeanette had not originally noticed. The other camera showed a person walking away from the direction of the McPhail home, carrying something in their arms at 2.25 a.m. And again, we know from what they had concluded in the autopsy that Alicia had been carried because her feet had no sand or injuries on it. Yeah, it so, just looks like a big bundle in his arms. Right. When mm-hmm. you see this footage, it's automatically, you know from that evidence, that has to be the killer on that camera footage. Jeanette testified that a jacket, shorts, underwear, and t-shirt recovered near the crime scene were in fact her son's clothing. And the knife found by the shore came from her kitchen. Aaron's DNA was matched to samples taken from Alicia's face, clothing, and 14 body parts. He did a lot of covering up, but there's just stuff that you cannot account for. But then there's stuff like the clothes and the knife, right? Like You know what's coming from your mom's kitchen. You know that these are your clothes, right? Again, front temporal lobe, not fully formed, 16 years old. There's so many ways that he tried to cover up and so many ways that he just, there's no way to do it right. And he just, yeah. Aaron's phone records were submitted as evidence so the jury could see that he Googled how do police find DNA and that he snapped that mirror pic saying that he found the guy who did the murder. Aaron's defense team argued that he had lost his phone while he was out late trying to buy weed. He took the stand in his own defense, claiming that he had never even met Alicia and said that he never could have murdered her. That's balls. Like, it's just, it's not balls. It takes nothing to do this. But like, my God, get up there and say you never even knew her? Yeah, it's just very sick. It's just he's so comfortable lying and deceiving, you know? That's what it is. It's like it's it's insulting to other people's intelligence. And this is where I'm just like annoyed with even more. Just like, what the fuck, man? Seriously? You have text messages, messages, pictures. You were there. You know her. Like, stop it. You know the brother. You know Tony. Stop it. You've been inside the house. The They're connection's your Tony. Your neighbors. Stop. You know? So, of course, even knowing that Alicia's been there every other weekend. You have the nerve to look us in the face and tell us you don't even know her. And you live next door. It's just unbelievable that he would go that far to say that and lie to something that's provable. Like we've talked about before. Why would you lie about something that's Googleable? We talk about this all the time because (laughs) we'll just never understand it. Courtney is getting so fast talking so and so <laughs> so hot. Like I'm so pissed. Here's where the change happens this and like it. conspiracy court comes out. The arms are flailing. <laughs> it's always when they're trying to cover it and like they're making us think that we're like trying to say we're stupid. Yeah, I think for you the thing is like <laughs> for me I'm always like background and lead up and psychology and for court it's always like 
it's the aftermath where they're trying to cover their tracks and they're lying. That's the part that gets you. For me, it's the beforehand where it's preventable. And for you, it's the after the fact where it's like they really show their ass on how supremely evil and deceptive they are. That's the part that gets you. You have no idea how right you are because I was at the (laughs) library the other day waiting on a mechanic and I got a book. I got a library card, a new one specifically so I could get a book. It's called how to spot a liar. And it's sitting on my coffee table right now. That is what I'm into and the bling ring. But yeah, those are the two books that I got at the library this week. Right. That's like your thing where you're just, yeah. It's Don't you dare insult my intelligence. Lying and the yes. deception. That's Obviously, the button for Courtney. The psychology of this is I was called stupid a lot or something, right? <laughs> and so, or like, you know, you have no common sense, for example. Oh, don't you dare. And I'm going to tell you why. Right. Yeah, but that's definitely for you. I mean, anytime, and it's so common that we see this in these cases where people will flat out say things that are provable, that we know that he knew Alicia, we know that they were neighbors. So for him to lie about that on the stand, and then you are so obviously a liar, everything else in your testimony gets called into question. You know, that's the thing is it's just strange to me because it's so easy to see that the rest of your testimony is garbage. And also, this is you lying to a town that you, I mean, this is a small town, an island you've grown up on. This is not you lying to the Van Nuys Courthouse in LA, in New York City, right? These Where are, nobody knows nobody you. Nobody knows you. Nobody knows that you're actually neighbors. Yeah. No, you're right. This is the thing that's crazy. He's lying in front of people that live the next house over that have seen him and Alicia talk or something, you know? The court reporter is probably like his classmate's mom who knows where he lives and has dropped him off in carpool. Right. It's crazy that he would get this bold and brazen with his lies. That's exactly what it is, I think. It's just the gall, right? The (laughs) nerve. His behavior during the trial was described as, quote, strikingly composed, unfazed, and articulate. Asshole. Aaron stated that the person who did this would be evil, and that's not him. Hmm. His defense team tried to pin the murder on Tony McLaughlin, Alicia's father's 17-year-old girlfriend, who had since turned 18 by the time of the trial. Aaron claimed that he and Tony had a sexual relationship that began in the winter of 2017. Which, it's important to point out, Tony had always vehemently denied that anything had happened between them. According to Aaron, Tony became so jealous of the attention that Robert and his parents gave to Alicia that she came up with a plot to get rid of the little girl. He claimed that Tony came up with a plan to have sex with Aaron that night and keep the condom so that she could plant his DNA on Alicia's body after she killed her. Oh, really? This is just, it's so unbelievable that he would think it's okay to point the finger at her. It's so sad and tragic. And he just insisted that she was the one that had motive, that she had done all of this to get rid of Alicia as the obstacle in the way of receiving 100% of Robert's attention. Tony's like one of the most tragic figures in this whole thing. I I really, from the get, I feel terrible for Tony because this 17-year-old starts like, okay, 17, she's with a 26-year-old man. There's probably an imbalance of power here, right? Tony probably has a little bit of identity issues, right? Wants some sort of father figure. We could speculate that there's daddy issues as well, right? It's possible that there was some dynamic within the relationship that was unhealthy to begin with. But then after the murders. But, okay. You know, I'm I'm just assuming that that's where you're going. For sure. But then there's also the fact that, like, he says that she's jealous of the baby. But, like, Tony is on her own. You see pictures of her with Alicia. She loved that little girl. Yeah. She's the one checking on her. Dad isn't checking on, t- on little baby right. at night. She was the last Tony. person to see her alive because, yes. um, you know, she was very invested in Alicia as her stepdaughter. That Even her though she was only 17. 17 years old and had She really that. saw her as someone that was so close. She was family. She had that maternal instinct for Alicia. Yeah. And Tony just gets like... 
I, bl- I honestly think, too, that being that young, being 17 and he's 16, they knew each other. They had a relationship. He says it, too. They knew each other prior. I mean, maybe, you know, they he liked her. They liked her at some point. But I don't believe. I believe Tony completely. Right. 100%. She's the one that's telling the truth again and again. Yeah, if we know her as the person that's always been honest, she's always been the person looking out for Alicia. And then we look at Aaron's track record. He's always been a liar. He's always been violent. I mean, it's just apples. I mean, it's night and day. They're two completely opposite different people. So who are you going to think wants to harm Alicia? The person that's always been protecting and loving or the person that historically has been nothing but violent and negative towards members of the community, you know? So it's pretty clear. Again, it's one of those things where it's like, why lie about something that's so obviously not true? Saving a condom with this right. fucking bullshit. Come on. Wipe it on a kid. Stop. Stop it. Again. Oh, I'm hot. I, know, I'm, I don't I'm believe you. I'm sitting here like, slow down, Sorry. Court. Slow I down. I don't believe you. This is why people are like, I'm anxious. <laughs> I'm anxiety inducing. I know. I'm so, aware of it. I'm sorry. The thing was that since Tony was 18 and Aaron was not, they blasted her name all over the media, embarrassing her. But again, Aaron was a minor, so they didn't put out his real name because they couldn't. So Tony was the face of this entire trial. She was the face of the murderer because of this speculation. She, again, there's, we always talk about multiple, like, victims around the person who lost their life and she was an additional victim in this murder it's so sad pisses me off how tony really it just how she was treated it's just fucked up it's so so tragic they really 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 blamed her besides how far-fetched the story was one of the main arguments disproving aaron's claims was the fact that the small 17 year old tony could not easily carry almost 50-pound Alicia for this 15-minute walk down the beach. It just didn't seem likely at all that she would be strong enough. There's a picture of Tony holding Alicia. And I mean, Alicia's, I swear to God, only like six and a half inches taller than Tony. In this right. Pic- like, she's a little tiny girl. Yes. Tony's little. Tony is very petite. Yeah. Aaron, on the other hand, was known, again, as very strong and athletic for his young age, and he could bench press 110 pounds. This was something that was well known. Yet he claimed that he wouldn't be able to carry 49-pound Alicia, which made Aaron, again, one more time, seem like a liar. Again, I saw the videos. I know that you're you're full of shit. Go to YouTube and it's like, yeah, you're he's lying about that. It's, it's obvious. not true. After only a 9-day trial, the jury deliberated for 3 hours before unanimously deciding that Aaron was guilty on all counts. Judge Matthews described this case as overwhelming, and although it hadn't been done before, he reversed the naming of a minor restriction on Aaron after his conviction, which allowed him to be identified by the media for the first time. Good. That's very, very out of the ordinary. This just doesn't happen. But he was so, it's seeming, I think that probably Tony had to be a factor that she can't be the face of this murder. If we convict Aaron, we know he's guilty. It's time for him to be identified as the murderer. Also on the t- on the Isle of Butte during this, because they wouldn't name who it was, there was just speculation so rampant that it was like, Tony's being affected, all the kids in the neighborhood are being affected too, and they already know who it is, who's missing. So it was just like, you know what, let's just clear this up. Yeah, and I'm glad that he did that, although it's so out of the ordinary, and for most people, you know, it would be important to protect them, but Aaron, it's time for him to be identified so that the community can be safe. I mean, also, you know, there's he didn't deserve protection anymore. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If it involves Good. the whole community <laughs> seeing him as a violent offender yeah. repeatedly, this is not the first time that we've heard stories of things he's done. We need to know that, yes, that's the guy. That's the kid that did it. Judge Matthews told Aaron, quote, Your attitude was clearly demonstrated by the evidence that you posted an image of yourself in a mirror while making a joke that
that you had found where the murderer was hiding. The arrogance and callousness of that is breathtaking. At his sentencing on March 21st, social workers said that Aaron had confessed in detail and went as far as to say that he was, quote, quite satisfied with the murderer. I heard that over and over again, and it was just like somebody had asked him, you know, like, oh, where, how do you feel about this? He's quite satisfied with the murder. I mean, that's a direct line, direct quote. Yeah, he really, with all the things that he's exhibited beforehand and things he said after, it's safe to assume he's just deeply disturbed and evil. You know, it's just unfortunate that Alicia was caught in the crossfire of this. Psychologists stated in court that he still has thoughts of raping children, sex with dead bodies, and murder. Man, I just really hope that they get him the right treatment to get to the bottom of this stuff. Because if he has to go back on the streets and is still going through that kind of stuff, it's just, or anybody that's serving time with him, you know, they need to get that under control. Because of the revelations from social workers and psychologists, Judge Matthews called Aaron, quote, cold, calculating, remorseless, and lacking in victim empathy. Judge Matthews's statement is, it's on YouTube, you can watch it. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good for considering the one that told Ted Bundy he would have loved to have, you know, tried with him on a case someday. He was so smart and, you know, wonderful. No, Judge Matthews is just like, this. you fucked up and this is why. He's the opposite of yes. the Bundy judge. He's just really trying to hold him accountable and tell him, what a terrible person he is. He's law and order. Yeah. He sentenced Aaron to a minimum of 27 years. Robert yelled fucking scumbag at Aaron as he was being led away after the verdict. Judge Matthews made a point to specifically state that Tony was completely innocent and the claims against her were a travesty of the truth. I'm glad he made that specification too me too absolutely yeah and she was dragged through when it. you see what happened to tony i mean i think it's really really a great thing that he stood up for her because nobody else was everybody was pointing the finger outside the court alicia's mother told the press that the only sentence that she'd accept was a life sentence he should have had no human rights and doesn't deserve anything because he is inhuman. There's a picture of Georgina, Alicia's mom, coming out of the courthouse. And it is like you feel her emotion. There's some pictures that you see that you can just feel it coming through the picture. And oh, my God. Poor little. And she's so young. Yeah, my heart goes out to her. It's just so sad. And I can understand why she would feel yeah. so severely, so angry towards him. And, and I just, I hope that she finds some peace, you know? It's so sad. On May 25th, 2019, a pink bench was dedicated to Alicia's memory on the Ross Say Promenade. And in June, her former school unveiled a new playhouse for the kids in her memory which was painted by her classmates. In September 2019, Aaron won an appeal that reduced his sentence to 24 years. He is eligible to apply for parole at the age of 40 years old. Gross. At least the reduction was only three years, right? Oh, yeah. I would have been pissed if they took like 10, 15 years off his sentence. So you got 24 years to go visit Butte, basically. <laughs> then so uh, terrible. After that, it's not safe. Yeah. He's currently at H.M. Young Offenders Institution in Pullman, and at 21, he'll be moved to an adult prison. Aaron's beloved YouTube channel was removed soon after he was identified as the killer. Aaron's parents, Jeanette and Chris, have since divorced. Jeanette says that they split because Chris and Aaron blamed her for his arrest since she was the one who had turned over the CCTV footage to the police and kind of set things in motion for him to be caught. That guilt complex has, whoa, just, whew. 
yeah, she was the one that set things in motion. She also testified at yeah. the trial, you know, but it's like he murdered someone. She had to do the right thing. This yeah. is a person that clearly has a moral compass. Like she struggled with her own issues, but she has a moral compass and she does right. When she knows it's the wrong thing, she does the right thing. And like I keep bringing up, oh, I know I've said it multiple times, but everybody on the Isle of Butte saw this girl, Alicia, as it could have been one of her own. So I'm assuming that's what happened with Jeanette. Like, yes, this is my son, but this could have easily been my child, too. If there's a predator out there, they have to get off the streets, even if it's my child. His mother, Jeanette, visited him often while his identity was still kept secret. But once it was ruled that he could be publicly identified, she stopped visiting him since she is now too scared that someone will follow her from the prison and then target her. Chris has disowned his son, Aaron, and will not visit him. Which is interesting because he's the one so pissed that the wife identified him, yet he's not willing to go see him. What does it matter if he visits him in his prison life? He didn't visit him in his real life. Right. He's always so been what does an it absentee father. So why change now? There were many moments in this that I just kept thinking of the movie Kids. You know, just like yeah, living their own lives. Running on the street. Running the street. Just doing dealing whatever they wanted. with adult things as kids. And not knowing how to deal with them because they're kids. They shouldn't be dealing with these adult issues, you know? They're not emotionally prepared for the kind of, you know, alcohol and drug use and the kind of sex and whatever is going on within their little group. But, yeah, it's just sad. It's just really, really tragic. This one was rough. Yeah. None of these killer kids are easy. But this one was really just... If that community of kids wasn't really prepared to deal with those sort of things. They also weren't prepared to hold one of their peers accountable for their violent behavior. So when we're always like, see something, say something, you know, watch out for people next to you. I mean, ideally, someone would have called out, hey, let's get Aaron some help. Hey, let's report to an adult that Aaron has a problem. But a lot of these kids just weren't in a place emotionally to do that. And it's so sad that nobody intervened before someone got hurt, you know? I guess you don't want to blow up your spot when you live on Party Island. I guess. I mean... Like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it because our parents let us do whatever the fuck we want, Yeah, right? just keep the attention just off. No, he's a weirdo, right? Make sure your sister doesn't date him. That's whatever. It. Yeah. He makes parkour trampoline videos, like... <laughs> Everybody knew about the Slender Man shit. I don't know. Yeah. This is just a, a tragic, tragic story. But we're still going to do it all over again yes, with more killer kids next week. Yep. Uh, so, yeah. Hopefully you'll be with us next time when we talk about another killer kid. In the meantime, you can hear us on Patreon on our bonuses. You can get at ad free episodes so we wanted to say thank you before we get out of here to our new patrons Ajua Brody Gia Paris and Marsha thank you again so thanks you guys we really appreciate you definitely check out the bonus episodes if you aren't following us on Facebook Instagram and Twitter then head over there and give us a follow share some things come say hi to us we're always on there And if you want to read more about tonight's story and see all those trampoline videos that Courtney is watching, then check out the links in the show notes for more information. Yeah, it's all there. CCTV footage, trampolines, (laughs) it's all good. So I think that's it for us, unless you have any announcements. I have nothing to announce. Oh, well, I guess we should probably say, since people know that we're in the L.A. area, that we are safe from the fires. Oh, yes. We're we very safe. On the podcast, mark ourselves safe yeah. from here. Our throats are a little scratchy. Yeah. But. You could probably hear a little bit of nasally scratchiness. But other than that, we're doing OK. So um, I think we're going to get out of here and we'll be back with another killer kid next week. See you then. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. We all have songs that remind us of our first love and bands that make us think of a certain friend. Maybe you have a workout playlist or a favorite album to listen to on road trips. 
But do you ever wonder what was going on in the lives of the artist when they wrote the music that you connect to your own memories? Rockumentary Podcast fills in the blanks on what you may not know about the iconic artists making the music that's so meaningful to our own lives. Each episode is an in-depth biography spanning from a musician's childhood through all the challenges of their journey to success and how they handled finally achieving fame. On Rockumentary, you'll hear about Kurt Cobain becoming a janitor at the same high school that he dropped out of, or how Jimi Hendrix was kidnapped and held for ransom for two days. Our episodes include details about Notorious B.I.G. marrying Faith Evans after knowing her for only a week, and Phil Spector pulling a gun on the Ramones when they tried to end a long recording session. You may know the music, but on Rockumentary, you'll hear the stories behind the songs. Search for Rockumentary on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you like to listen to podcasts. Is being active a part of your day? If not, we can help. We're New Jersey Snap Ed, and we offer fun ways to help you do something active and healthy each day. For fun fitness ideas and activities, visit njsnap-ed.gov today. That's njsnap-ed.gov. Is being active a part of your day? If not, we can help. We're New Jersey Snap Ed. And we offer fun ways to help you do something active and healthy each day. For fun fitness ideas and activities, visit njsnap-ed.gov today. That's njsnap-ed.gov.